Hello, this is Emiliana Simon Thomas, also here with Dacker Keltner and Donna Hayes. Welcome to our second live video Q&A for the Science of Happiness from the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, tied to GG101X, the Science of Happiness on edX.org. Today, it is my profound pleasure to be joined by my co-instructor, instructor, Dacker Keltner. Uh, Dacker, you wanna say hi? Hello, everybody, and nice to see you, Emiliana, and thank you, Donna. And Donna Hayes, who uh, I'll let you say a little bit, Donna, about what brought you here and why you've been such a dedicated part of our community. Sure. Hi, my name is Donna Hayes. Um, I'm actually I'm part of this from New Jersey. I'm actually from New Jersey originally. Um, and I attended the Science of Happiness last year when it was, from, you know, the constructed one from September through Thanksgiving time. And it really impacted me profoundly. Um, so I wanted to continue to give back and I wanted to continue to be engaged in the science of happiness. Um, and I thought it was really, like I said, it was, it just hit me in a bunch of different profound ways. Um, I, had, um, I had done some positivity psychology kind of research before, but this really um, enabled me to put some things into practice um, and uh, allowed me to uh, really focus on leading a meaningful life. So I am thrilled to be a part of it. I'm thrilled to be talking to both you, Emiliana, and Docker. Um, so uh, thrilled to be here and uh, thrilled to be engaged in this process. Well, it's super wonderful. I was telling Donna a little bit before we began our broadcast how important our community TAs are to this course. Um, Dacker and I are well seasoned in teaching face-to-face -face courses to students and adults and people around the world and there's something really different about trying to do a course virtually and our community TA program is really um, directed towards forming that sense of community that's that's a little bit easier to do face-to-face -face. but here we are face-to-face -face virtually <laughs> and live so uh, if you're on the call if you're watching please don't be shy about submitting questions uh, we really like to have be able to address people's ideas and thoughts in, in real time so we have questions that people have submitted via the discussion board within the course and basically we're going to have a conversation using these questions and I'm going to invite Donna to sort of bring up the first issue that was brought up by no less than seven people. So we, 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 we see that a lot of people are, are, are thinking about the same ideas or similar ideas. So we really want to kind of um, consider them together. So, so Donna, what was, what was the biggest idea that came up in, in this discussion thread? Sure, sure. Um, there have really been, I guess, you know, some major things going on right in the world um, today. And um, so it's not only environmental. So we've had, you know, the earthquake in Mexico. We've had, you know, these major hurricanes, you know, annihilating the islands. But then we have something like Las Vegas occur um, last week. And, um, and you know, uh, I guess, considering some of these, you know, latest events and tragedy, um, tragic type events, how do we, how do we continue to stay focused on, um, on building our happiness as a community and as a world and, um, and on this earth? And really, how do we, you know, how do we continue to do that in the face of some of these things that have, that, you know, have happened and continue to happen? So go ahead, I guess you guys, go ahead, you're the experts. <laughs> so what are your thoughts, I guess, on, on um, really how to stay focused on, um, you know, leading a meaningful life and, and being empathetic and, you know, and exhibiting forgiveness in some of the faces of some of these tragic events that seem to come out of absolutely nowhere? Absolutely. Yeah, so, um... I mean, I mean, that is the question of the day, right? And um, I, I think there is a large scale, high level answer, and then there are more specific answers. And Emiliana and I always try to kind of bring in the big themes of life and then the more specific practices. And, and I really, um, you know, the pursuit of happiness um, is often easy 
in easier political and social times, right? Um, you know, when there's more equality in a culture, as, as we teach in the class, or there's greater democracy in a culture, um, the pursuit of happiness is, doesn't face these headwinds, right? And these countervailing forces. Uh, but you have, to, you have to stay really strong at it in, when things are really hard, right? When you're experiencing personal trauma or personal strife or cultural strife. And I really take heart in a couple of literatures at this high level. One is you know, somebody that Emiliana and I cite, who is Karen Armstrong, the religious historian. Uh, and in her book, The Great Transformation, she writes about how 2,500 years ago, throughout the world, uh, things like the Greater Good Science Center started to develop in, in their particular historical form. And you know, there was Confucius, and Jesus would come 500 years later, and Lao Tzu, and Buddhism. And they were all interested, they were facing very materialistic, violent times where there's a lot of tribalism and genocide, uh, like we worry about today, and demagogues and leaders that were tearing things apart. And they built up these systems to, to really build more cooperative societies. And those are with us today. And I really view the Greater Good Science Center as an embodiment of that idea, which is when you're facing really hard stuff, or really nasty people, uh, or you know, climate climate type change or forces. This is the shining moment for altruism and sharing and empathy and the like. And I think a lot of the data support this this uh, this assumption. And then the second thing to do is to take the practices of the Greater Good Science Center and and really direct them with full force at the hardest stuff, right? If you feel really dissatisfied with the political context, or you're really worried about what Harvard political scientists are documenting, like the rise of authoritarianism, or kind of the, the turning the blind eye to people who are suffering through climate change, and really direct those principles at those issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been uh, talking to a lot of people lately about um, something that came out of my book in The Power Paradox, which is how do you deal with bullies at work and people? At, you know, who are coercive and aggressive and really undermining our best efforts. And, and I think the consensus in that field is like, this is where these principles work the best, which is, you know, remember people who are harming things come out of positions of suffering, kind of a kindness meditation. Remember to be strong and bold, right? And self-compassionate. Remember to use the stress reduction techniques that Emiliana talks about, about this is the moment you know, when I'm worried about shooters or the like, or it, to really cultivate mindfulness with the greatest force to, and to spread it to others. Remember to be charitable. Um, so I think this is a time to really, uh, really double down on these principles. Yeah, that was so helpful, Dacker. Uh, thanks for laying out the context and the history. I think sometimes taking that broad perspective can be um, a builder of optimism when yeah. things seem immediately so perhaps hopeless or tragic. Um, building a few other ideas that, that, that are perhaps more specific, um, I think sometimes in the face of a barrage of news headlines that are discouraging or problematic, it, it's really helpful to perhaps stop for a minute and take a breath and practice a little bit of awareness of exactly what it is that you're experiencing in the given moment. We have these terrifically powerful mental capacities that allow us to think about ideas and the future and perhaps uh, reflect on the past, which can be incredibly supportive of our health and well-being, but they can also get us into habits of thinking that don't serve our happiness. And so when we notice for a moment, okay, in this moment right here, right now, I'm enjoying, I'm a very lucky person. I'm enjoying physical warmth. I've had something to eat. I am in the company of people who are wonderful and supportive and delightful and do contribute to my well being. Uh, if, if we can sort of continue to tap into what we do have access to, what our privileges are, sometimes that can be a powerful force of strength in perhaps um, applying some of our abilities or, or the frustration that we might feel about certain circumstances 
to to improving them or contributing in a meaningful way. So of course I'm referring to to, to mindfulness and mindfulness is the topic of um, of, of this week of the science of happiness. So. Uh, we have some very specific practices in the course that people can try. Um, I know mindfulness is an interesting um, idea that comes from a particular place, and some might feel like it has kind of a spiritual or a religious origin that is exclusionary, but that's not how scientists think about it anymore. It has really sort of been lifted out of a specific context and brought into a very popularly accessible place. It's not about a particular God or uh, orientation towards your spiritual thinking or any beliefs. It's really just about being more aware of what you do moment to moment in your mind and what kinds of experiences you have and perhaps what you can do to notice things that are gonna be most constructive for you. In saying that, I also wanna caution against the idea that trying to achieve greater happiness is about feeling pleasure and enthusiasm and positivity all the time. Um, we, we talk about this in the first week of the course and yeah. it's very, very, very pervasive and common misunderstanding yeah. uh, that happiness means that we need to be happy all the time and happy being that kind of brief emotional state, which is Dacker and I would both uh, claim based on scientific research is, is not actually a good rendering of that emotional state. There are very much more specific positive states that are adaptive and function in particular circumstances that get lumped under the umbrella of happiness. So again, when you're feeling sad, that's a really important signal. When you're feeling angry, that tells you something about how you believe and what you might might should be doing with your time and your effort to to realize the meaningful kind of pursuit that you might have in life as a person. So it's not easy. Um, I struggle. I'm sure uh, all of the readers or, or students who who submitted these questions are, are resonating with, with that challenge. Um, challenge can be a very great motivator to, yeah. to making a difference. So, so thank you for that question. Um, it's super important uh, and deep and profound respect and support to people who were at all involved and or touched or affected by the yeah. recent events in Las Vegas. Uh, it is heartbreaking and um, it is a reflection of some serious yeah. problems. And um, uh, it, I, I think sometimes the challenge is figuring out how we can be most, um, most uh, make the biggest contribution. Uh, we, we feel remote, we feel distant. And um, I, I think another perhaps heartwarming enterprise can be to, to, to really value the, the power of your local behaviors. So yeah. are you in your own neighborhood, in your own communities, contributing and engaging in a way that will lessen the possibility of, of the people you can touch, you know, and day in and day out uh, being involved in something that is that harmful and hurtful. So I just wanna recognize that for a moment before we go on to the next question. <laughs> but it's a really good connecting question because we've almost talked about it already. And people wanted to know, Dacker, about um, the, 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 the ways that we might maintain our own composure or balance when we are offering support or compassion to others. Um, I think it's a very common experience when you're perhaps have had one of those days where multiple people in sequence or multiple situations come towards you um, or you encounter them and they all call upon you to contribute or invest or be of support in some way or another and and that can feel draining right it yeah. can feel exhausting yeah. so how do we kind of keep it together when yeah. we're faced with this demand or how do we recover yeah um yeah, I mean, there's no doubt, you know, some of the data that we profile in the class show that uh, stress has risen uh, in the last 30 years in our daily lives. Uh, everybody feels that. I think it's pretty well documented. I think in the last couple of years, it's risen even more dramatically with for economic, political, climate reasons. Um, and so that permeates our face-to-face -face encounters with other people. Um, you know, when you're at work and you have one person after another who's really uh, stressed out about 
whatever may be going on, if you're at family or, or the like. Um, and I think that what, what was really interesting, you know, I had the great opportunity to write this piece for the Harvard Business Review coming out of my work on leadership and organizational life. And, and the editor said, take the principles of the greater good and translate them to answer this very question, which is, you know, you're, you're interacting with a lot of intense people who are stressed out. What do you do? And I find when you distill those practices down that we teach, right, in each encounter, and you just give yourself a moment or two before each meeting or conversation, a tough conversation with a teenager or somebody at work, uh, you stay balanced, to use the language of the, the person who asked the question. So what I really think is important is, you know, return to just a brief moment of mindfulness. Uh, remember, you know, what is the intention of this interaction? Practice a lot of the empathic listening stuff that we do. Take, you know, slow it down, ask good questions, make nice eye contact, make your body relaxed, change your tone of voice. Um, use the language of face-to-face -face appreciation, which we've studied in my lab, where you're recognizing the dignity of other people. You know, so that slowing it down, breathing, mindfulness, and empathy, orienting to others. As we teach throughout the class, M, as you well know, you teach it. <laughs> you know, when you get into this state, and it's accessible all the time, you move out of that stressed cortisol, HPA, you know, sympathetic autonomic nervous system profile, like, God, things are out of control. So like, I can handle whatever comes my way, you know, and, and so I, I, that's what I think the challenge for us to do. And I know, you know, the Greater Good Science Center is moving into translating these principles to workplace dynamics uh, that, that are implied in the question or alluded to in the question of like, how do I, if I'm a nurse and you know, I'm in the emergency room and there's all this chaos and stress. How do I keep my feet on the ground? And I think the principles apply well. Mm -hmm. um, I would add uh, uh, some recent literature that I am fascinated by on something called, well, it has a couple different terms, but one of them is decentering and another one is psychological distancing. And yeah. sometimes those sound a little weird, like, Mm, I wouldn't want to do, do those on face value, but I'll flesh out what they're referring to. They're referring to trying to take kind of a meta perspective when you're in the midst of one of these moments where you start to feel like your own um, core balance uh, falling to the wayside. You start to feel like I can't maintain my composure or stay um, open to a situation because I'm feeling so distressed by it, sometimes it's really valuable to take this kind of meta perspective and yeah. go, oh, and, and I'll just demonstrate it. Emiliana is feeling really anxious right this minute. And it's so crazy that yeah. one exercise of naming my own feeling as if I'm like a third awareness has been shown to really help with the recovery from the, those feelings in that moment. So yeah. can you kind of just take your immediate kind of uh, feelings of despair and name them and perhaps explain them or think about them from, a, from an outside perspective as if it's not happening right then and there in your own, in your own consciousness. Um, that can be something that's really helpful in those moments where you're beginning to feel really depleted relate to them in that way. The other is um, is to bring up the, the topic of gratitude, which we're going to yeah. cover later on in a couple of weeks. Um, gratitude is a really uh, important way to maintain your sense of deep and profound connection with others, the extent to which other people really contribute in an essential and formative way to your own goodness in life. And when you are in a situation where you're beginning to feel like perhaps others, because of a repeated experience, others as a whole just make life hard for you, right? It can be really valuable to find that person who yeah. really does lend you a deep nice. support, connect with them, think about them, imagine what it is about them that makes you have that warm feeling of, of care and gratitude and um, reflect, reflect on that. Sometimes that can be really helpful when you feel your own reserves kind of start to dissipate. Um, I'm gonna pass the, uh, the mic over to Donna again for our next question. 
that kind of leads into that next question, yeah. actually. Um, so when you have others that are, I guess, close to you, um, others that you even live with that are depressed or unhappy or not, I guess, um, at least from your vantage point, um, you know, leading, you know, finding joy and, and finding meaning in their life and purpose. Um, it's really easy to, um, yeah. it's actually, there, there's kind of two parts to this question. It's easy to get sucked into the unhappiness or mm -hmm. into the, you know, negativity, but it's also um, difficult for you to, you know, to, I guess, um, you know, focus on the science of happiness and focus on a meaningful life when other, when somebody who is very close to you, you know, is not able to do that. So I guess I'll, you know, pass it over to you guys. What do you think about that? And what are some, I guess, ways to navigate that? I, I think in, in one respect, it's a demonstration of how we, we it, it's not helpful always to think of the ideas that, that we talk about on the course as a panacea that will yeah. do everything to support our happiness. So why is it then we're, when we're around someone we care about who is despondent and perhaps not uh, doing, not rowing their own boat in terms of maintaining uh, a state of mind that is amenable to happiness, that we also start to feel despondent? Well, in part, it's, it's the very empathy that helps us to uh, laugh when others are laughing or feel a sense of concern when others are going through a difficult time that that puts at set puts us at risk personally of sharing the sort of ongoing despondency that somebody else might be exhibiting who is in proximity to us and this really sort of um, taps into questions around the difference between empathy and compassion yeah what we know about empathy in the brain is that it has there are multiple circuits that are in empathy and some of them are really important for sharing the kinds of uh, physiological responses that another person might be exhibiting who is close to you or yeah. for really understanding uh, what their feelings are and what they mean and why they're happening and then there's a third sort of segment of it which is really important for acknowledging or basically knowing that what they're feeling is a feeling that is theirs alone and is not actually your own emotional experience that is emergent from your own circumstances. Some might call this sort of self-other distinction. Um, I don't actually think that we get confused about who's who, but we certainly can take an experience that's happening as a result of someone else's expressions and think about it in a way or interpret it or judge it as somehow our own. And then we're in this situation where we're feeling empathic distress and it's very common and it's hard to notice in real time. And the people who have really uh, offered the, the most insight into how to do that are people who are very committed to the practice and cultivation of compassion. Compassion is really focused on that third element, right? How can we, in the face of supporting another person's difficult experience instead of spiraling down to it ourselves tap into these fourth circuits <laughs> and to really kind of get into these because i think it's too long to do on this call or on this q a live to get into the nuances of each of those systems but 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 this fourth one is the periaqueductal gray and the medial prefrontal preoptic pre area that are quintessentially involved in nurturance and caregiving behaviors so if we can kind of quiet down the um, mirrored sort of distress signaling, we allow these caregiving circuits to come online. And those are not only important for our capacity to be of support, but they also at the same time help us recover from our own existential angst or difficulty or distress. And practicing compassion is, is it's not just a one second thing. It can be a long-term enterprise. Yeah. But what we know is when people do it, their whole neurophysiological profile shifts. Tanya Singer has done a ton of brilliant work looking at the difference between an empathic distress response and what we would call a compassion response. And when people get really good at compassion, they practice it, they train it, they show 
signals in their brain that are more consistent with a, a loving, kind, sort of compassionate and, and rewarding experience around uh, providing support to others. So those are two ideas that I think relate to that particular question. What do you think, Jacker? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a phenomenally important question. And early in the clinical, cl the clinical literature, uh, like Connie Hammond at UCLA and others were finding that, you know, if you are living with a depressive person or a really anxious person, those clinical conditions will spread to people around them, right? Caregivers and romantic partners and friends. And suddenly you're agitated and experiencing their distress for the neurophysiological reasons that Emiliana is talking about, which is, you know, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex mm -hmm. in you takes on other people's suffering. And next thing you know, you're suffering. Um, and, and I think the first response is just to remember the science of happiness is a complement to clinical approaches. And it's always important, like if you have somebody who's really depressed or really clinically anxious or OCD or whatever it is, clinical work, you know, they know how to work with some of those. Um, I think there are a couple of really interesting processes that Emiliana and I are starting to profile more in the class because the science is new that help the, the caregiver in this case uh, do what Emiliana was talking about, which is calm down that basic HPA driven stress response. Um, and one is, is just recognition and labeling, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you're in a, a dynamic where, whoa, you know, my teenage daughter is showing signs of depression again, and it's keeping me up all night, or it's, it's making me anxious. Just, we know neuroscientifically, labeling it, recognizing it, remembering that that state changes, that these are developmental trajectories, right? So um, that will actually engage prefrontal cortex and calm down the stress response. So just honestly recognize stuff, uh, and the second thing is, um, there's this new literature, uh, I can't remember if we profiled it yet, Emiliana, I'm teaching it at Berkeley, which is about just accepting hard stuff, mm -hmm. right? 41% of Americans, some estimates suggest, will have a clinical-like condition in their life. I've had anxiety at a clinical level. It's just, it's part of the human condition. You know, the first noble truth in Buddhism is life has suffering, you know, and it's, you're going to feel pain. You're going to have disease. People around you will suffer. But we're really good at shifting out of the, like, this is overwhelming to, wow, I feel empowered to accept this, to embrace this. Mm -hmm. You know, just a little funny story. Um, when I got to be involved in Inside Out uh, with Pete Docter at Pixar, uh, the fundamental lesson of that movie is, you know, life has sadness. It's okay. You know, like Emiliana said earlier, like you're going to get really angry at some things in life, really angry. You may pound things or whatever, and that's okay too, you know, uh, and that stance of acceptance. Now the new data are showing helps us just really do well with the tough stuff of life and uh, important to bring to bear in, in those situations you're describing, Donna. Thank you. Yeah, um, there was a online submission question uh, from a student, Chris Wesselman. Uh, hi, Chris, I remember you. Uh, Dapper, <laughs> if you remember Chris, he's a photographer from Stanford. Uh, or nice. area. Anyway, he wanted to know about trust and what you think is going on with trust in our nation and perhaps around the world, given current circumstances? Is, is trust really going to, are we at risk of, of, of a decline, a massive decline in trust? And, and if so, you know, what, what can we do? Well, I don't think we're at risk. I think it's already happening. And, you know, I'm just going to, you know, we know one of, one of the hardest things in uh, the life of happiness is tribalism. You know, the moral philosopher, Josh Green, uh, good friend and friend of the Greater Good Science Center, said like, you know, we are equipped to be compassionate and grateful and empathetic and playful and awesome. And, and that builds strong communities. Yeah. But there's one big problem that we got to watch out for, which is tribalism. And it is the, it's, you see it in chimps uh, where they will kill other chimps who violate their territory. You see it readily in humans with genocide, uh, just us, them distinctions. And, and we, 
have to work really hard to build trust across those boundaries. We have to speak with respect. We have to dignify other people. We have to uh, share resources. We have to build collaboration. Mm -hmm. All of those processes are supported by oxytocin, uh, kind of the neurophysiological underpinning of trust. Mm -hmm. And when we engage in social behaviors that degrade that, uh, you got trouble. And that's, you know, when you look at what's happening in the US today with the discourse, with hate crimes, uh, with bullying happening with students of color in different parts of the country, uh, on down the line, right? Uh, women vis-a-vis -vis men, uh, there's, it's, not, you know, it's, it's not complicated to make the claim that we, we have a trust crisis and you know, we gotta work at it. Yeah, yeah. Dacker and I both recently read a book by one of our beloved colleagues, Robert Sapolsky at Stanford called Behave Humans at Their Best and Their Worst. And there's quite a bit of content dedicated to the reasons that people um, engage in less than ideal constructive pro-social behavior towards people in out groups yeah. that we know about scientifically. And again, we could probably teach a whole separate yeah about trust yeah. building and where the pitfalls are and where the risks are and how valuable it can be for each of us to understand what habits we are vulnerable to that can enable us to behave in ways that aren't constructive in the space of trust. And yeah. again, I'd, this isn't a pitch for his book because I have any <laughs> vested interest, but that I read it and um, I, I found it to be very edifying. And um, and, and uh, if anybody really wants to know more about where we where where we're vulnerable beyond what Dacker just described, it, it has a very yeah. uh, explanation of of all the science that's been done in this space of what people tend to think about others and how their their sometimes very reflexive thoughts about others uh, drive them to behave in particular ways that don't always serve our best interests in the space of trust and prosociality. So um, we yeah. could go on. There's tons of information that Dacker writes about in his book about power, uh, where social inequality and socioeconomic privilege can also um, contribute to the, the degradation of trust. But uh, again, uh, we only have another 30 minutes, so I want to make sure. I just, can I just sing the praises yeah. of one other person who check into if you're interested in trust in the workplace, which is fundamental, is um, Christine Porath. Mm -hmm. who is either at Duke or USC, mm -hmm. and she just writes about how, you know, when we swear at people and when we interrupt people and when we exclude people in the workplace and bully them or coerce them, trust in the workplace just drops precipitously. Mm -hmm. And people start taking sick days and they don't like their work and mm -hmm. they, they want to move on and the bottom line suffers. So there are a lot of people who are thinking very actively about the stuff we teach M, which is this this immediate practices to yeah. build trust that I'd re it's a really great question, Chris. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, we'll shift a little bit to another question from the discussion boards that is uh, in the in the positive space. <laughs> and this, it was, yeah. Yeah. This person wants to know about hedonic adaptation. And and it's funny, I'll read the question as is because it, it reveals um, just a, a common, what I might argue, misperception about what we're capable of. But the question is, how do we prevent the hedonic adaptation to positive events? Um, I'm going to take a, a kind of hard neurophysiological stance here and say, sorry, <laughs> non-preventable, but I'll, I'll flesh that out. Um, and then I'll give a little bit of help, hope to that, which is really our nervous system is designed to keep us interested, to keep us motivated to novel opportunities and uh, ways to explore our environment. Uh, and, and, and we wouldn't have that if we didn't habituate to the good things that we experience. Sometimes people hold the notion that Humans, if all of their needs were met, if you had enough food, if you had enough um, sort of uh, access to warmth and security, you would then just sit on the couch and passively watch television or um, do really nothing. You would just sit around if, if all of your needs were met. And, and this is 
grossly not what we see. This is not how humans are wired. This is not how we behave. We adapt to the good things and the good circumstances. And in that, we then look around and try to find the next good problem to solve or the next good opportunity to pursue. Now, as with everything else, that comes with some possible pitfalls and, and what we often are more oriented to the pitfalls than the opportunities. And the pitfall, of course, is that we get something wonderful that we've wanted for a long time, an award, a kind of recognition, uh, a particular material possession that we've been imagining or anticipating was gonna be so wonderful. And it all feels great in the very beginning and then it doesn't necessarily last. And we feel perhaps like less hopeful because of that. Um, I, I don't think that that's something that we should fight against. I think it's more valuable to, to honor that as a way to give us a, a platform for pursuing the next interesting and meaningful pursuit. One last finding I do have to share, which is that Aaron Heller and Richie Davidson um, did a, a study where they put people who had learned how to meditate uh, into the fMRI scanner and looked at reward activation in response to a positive experience and did show that meditators, for meditators, that, that moment of, of pleasure, of delight in, in, that, in that signal of reward re, uh, recovered more slowly in people who are meditators. So perhaps there's an opportunity when something good happens in the moment of that to kind of have that experience a little bit longer, right? To extend that delight or that joy that comes from the, the, the positive experiences that we have. But again, the idea that we wanna sort of make that last forever uh, is, is probably not one that's gonna serve us in the end. What do you think, Dee? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I, I agree with you. Um, in, in the broader sense, which is that hedonic adaptation fits with the nervous system's commitment, if you will, to homeostasis, like you want a balanced organism. And it's interesting, um, you know, in, I now teach very heartily Aristotle's idea of the golden mean, moderation, which is you, you don't want to have extreme, enduring, excessive, positive emotions. Uh, because there's a lot of work that shows that that can be problematic to just adapting to the environment, right? If you're just always firing and taking delight. And, you know, I did this paper on people who are prone to mania and they have elevated vagal responses to everything, yeah. <laughs> you know, positive things, disgusting things. They're like, man, this is amazing. Uh, and that's problematic for them. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 um, I do think you know, one of the really interesting things um, and in teaching this class with you over these years is we get to watch the science evolve, right? And new things emerge. So for example, the old idea that 50% of our happiness is genetic, I think, I think that's going to be revised mm -hmm. with, you know, that used to be a canonical assumption about happiness mm -hmm. with the new literature on epigenetics and, you know, stuff that turns genes on and off. Uh, I think that's, that no longer holds water. Mm -hmm. And I will say, I don't think the data on hedonic adaptation are that great. I think mm -hmm. it's an idea that we quickly adapt to good things. Uh, it is a cool title, but does it apply to all kinds of stimuli, right? Do you, does a young parent adapt really quickly to a child, uh, infant's laugh? Does it adapt? There are new studies showing the particular scent of a two-day-old activates reward circuits in the brain. Mm -hmm. Do we always adapt to that? I, I think it's an open question. Uh, yeah. and, and we'll see what the science holds in the next five years, 10 years. Yeah, and no, I'm so glad you brought that up because often when I'm teaching about positive states, I'll differentiate the positive states that have a social dimension to them from the positive right. states that are simply about self-interest and personal reward. And I'll differentiate it on the basis of oxytocin and the yeah. caregiving circuitry. And I think those systems are less vulnerable to adaptation. Yeah. Uh, you know, if they weren't, we would never have long-term pair bonds. We yeah. would never be able to stay with our families who 
people will just put it out there, drive us bananas sometimes, <laughs> right? We, we love them and we love them for, for a long time, even though they're not always easy. Uh, and and I, I agree with you 100% that there's so much more room for a, a more sophisticated understanding of, of hedonic adaptation yeah. Yeah. and where it happens and where it doesn't. Yeah. Um, I do think it, it's probably gonna end up uh, sticking in the space of material pleasures. Yeah, and financial gain. That's right, and, and that's yeah. sort of Tom Gilovich, who studied yeah. at Cornell and who studies the difference between the pleasure we derive from a materialist a material purchase and an experiential purchase, and has this really wonderful legacy of science uh, pointing to how much more meaningful and enduring the positive feelings uh, we we get from experiences are than those positive experience feelings we get from say being one of the early adopters of the iPhone 10. Yeah. Which I'm not. <laughs> um, anyway, Donna, I wanted to bring you back in because I feel like you've been so delightfully aware and present. But um, we, we want to include you in the conversation. Uh, do you do you have question five from our discussion boards in front of you? Sure, I do. So it actually has to do a little bit with the workplace as well, like we were just talking about, but it also can apply other places as well. So. How does competition impact happiness? Um, so um, society kind of forces us to compare um, ourselves to each other, right? And, um, and very similar to what you just alluded to too with the materialistic things, you know, that person has this and I don't have that yet or this person makes this amount of money and I don't. I don't. Um, so can you, kind of expound upon that like how does competition impact happiness and um and you know should we you know be content at, you know and be um and show gratitude as to what we have versus um continuing to look for um for more mm -hmm. so i just came from a a, a work-related trip where i i traveled to malaysia and in Kuala Lumpur, I was part of a conference that was mainly attended by C-level executives who were speaking about the promise and pitfalls of various approaches to running a company or a business or adopting technology and artificial intelligence into their organizations. And um, so I was there, of course, not to talk about that. I was there to talk about <laughs> prosociality and how uh, essentially human it is and how important it is to maintain the core ideas that, that we cover at the Greater Good Science Center. But there was a lot of pushback in my personal conversations with various other um, participants of this conference about the value of competition and how important it was. And, how uh, we how inherently human uh, competition is as a as a as a core uh, experience and driver or motivator, and without it, again, humans would sit around and be lazy, um, which I I don't agree with at all. So I'll just bring up a funny little study that Dacker was involved in, or, or at least he was a, a mentor for the person who ran it which is how competition relates to happiness in a, in a sports context. Actually, quick digression. One of the speakers was a, 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 a high executive in the Alibaba group, which is a, a platform in the Southeast Asia in China, which supports peer-to-peer -peer commerce. He very specifically explained that his experience playing competitive sports during his college education in the US was instrumental to his understanding of teamwork and running a good business. So I have thought of that because of the other study that I was about to describe, which is John Tower's study where he compared the kind of positive feelings that people had in different competitive contexts. One of them, people play a game where they're shooting baskets and you individually try to get as many points as you can. Second, there are two different teams and they're competing against each other on each team and trying to win the game with the most baskets. And the third, um, everyone is on one team together. It's the you know universal human team and together everyone is shooting and trying to get as many baskets as they can. And what he found 
is that the middle condition, right, where people were on teams competing against each other was the one that was connected to the greatest sort of sense of enthusiasm and, and joy from the experience. And I think that reflects the human condition, which is we do derive quite a bit of success from com competing with one another and even ourselves and trying to to, to strive towards something better than the status quo. So there's something very valuable about it. The other aspect that you brought up, which, which, which I would call social comparison, right? This is worrying that you don't have what someone else has, or even uh, judging somebody else as inferior because you have more than they have. That's a different and darker territory. And actually, Dacker, since you've done so much work looking at power and socioeconomic yeah. difference, I, I wonder if you might be uh, the, the right voice to explain that space. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think Em really hit it well, which is that, you know, it's a misreading of the science of happiness to think that it's against competition or it's against free markets. You know, it's just this, we all hang around and meditate. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, that's, that's, that's a profound misreading of, of the work. Um, you know, we know, for example, when you encourage free markets in developing countries, and in particular, get resources to women, those countries do a lot better, right? Um, so, and I think the same is true with competition. And what Em is suggesting is that it really depends on how you do it. Yeah. And so we know um, collaboration with teammates and people who are in your team and doing exceptional work is really gratifying. It's some of the most gratifying work we can do. Um, we know that you know, the kind of the purpose-driven focus and going after goals that come out of competition is probably the fundamental activator of, um, of the dopamine circuit that gives you this sense of, as M very judiciously used the word enthusiasm, which is like, wow, we can go do this amazing stuff together. We can, you know, develop this product or, um, or you know, discover something or teach these kids. Uh, but it really depends on how you do it. Uh, and as M said, when I wrote this book on power, power paradox, I reviewed all this literature that comes out of really competitive environments. And there is one strategy to competing, which is like you lift other people up mm -hmm. and, and you make your team stronger. And that does really well for a lot of collective happiness. There's another strategy that I have been on a soapbox about, which is Machiavellianism, which is where you're primarily interested when you compete in taking other people down, mm -hmm. right? That as I undermine people and break up their networks and subvert that person's efforts, I rise. And, and the data are pretty clear that those people are less happy, they're socially isolated, they're marginalized in the workplace, um, they feel, um, you know, dissing, they feel ignored in opportunities for innovation. So it really depends how we compete because we competition of course is a, a part of human nature yeah absolutely um i'm gonna direct us to another live question that was submitted uh, in real time and this one is from nina s germany and she says imagine there was an imaging technique that directly showed neural activity regarding happiness what part of the body the nervous system, would you prefer to look at apart from the brain and why? Doctor, <laughs> have, any, have, any, have any quick responses to that? All right, you know me well, Em. You can, yeah. you can, you can make my guess. <laughs> uh, Vegas nerve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, the, you know, it's incredible just the data that are piling up on you know, that, that big bundle of nerves, the largest bundle of nerves in the human nervous system that wanders through your body, the vagus nerve and slows heart rate, helps with digestion. You know, we have about 10 studies uh, showing Jenny Steller's work, uh, former fellow at the GGSC, you know, that when I feel kind and I'm giving, the vagus nerve is activated. It's just associated with, it also is associated with handling stress well, you know, uh, wow, my partner just died. People with elevated vagus nerve response tend to handle trauma better. Um, so it, it does that kind of good work in terms of positive states and uh, handling the tough stuff well that we've been talking about today. So that's what I would do. 
Yeah. Uh, let's think of a, a wild one. Some part of the microbiome. <laughs> you know what? That is a very compelling emerging science. Uh, one, uh, one of the speakers in Malaysia who is actually from the US of Silicon Valley, something of a, of a doomsayer about the <laughs> risks that we're facing in terms of AI and, and technology that maybe we're not so aware of. But one of the examples he brought up was how in, in healthcare, we've had a long tradition of antibiotic use. Yeah. And antibiotic use is well known to wreak havoc on the microbiome. And now there's all these kind of emergent findings about how the microbiome is valuable to our immune system and yeah. even to the uh, functioning of our, of our nervous system on other levels and our yeah. cognitive abilities and our kind of emotional predilections and resilience. So absolutely. I mean, I would love, love, love to know more about that and to yeah. understand yeah. those dynamics. Um, and then I guess my last one would be, we're still not that great at measuring oxytocin in the brain, yeah. figuring out yeah. really what it's doing at a, perhaps, and, and I'll, I'm putting quotes here because I don't really love this distinction, but it's pervasive, which is the sort of cognitive versus affective differences uh, in, in what oxytocin is doing when it's introduced or, or yeah. playing a, a more formative role in, in the brain. Function. I agree. We know about oxytocin in the body, but um, we're not that great at measuring it. When we do measure it, and this is a question that was submitted, how do we do that? Um, and, and again, Dr. You've, you've done more oxytocin research than I have. Um, how, it, it's not that easy to measure oxytocin in real time. Yeah. There are studies that administer it, right? right. And they have a little intranasal applicator approach. Um, and the assumption is that having some is different than not having some in, in a, or at least some added oxytocin. But in terms of some kind of assay that would capture in a moment yeah. how much oxytocin is contributing to the functioning of your brain, uh, we really, yeah, we really don't, don't know yeah. have a great way to measure that. But what, what would you add to that, Dacker? Yeah, you know, you can do blood draws, right? Mm -hmm. We did a paper on that, but that you have got to be in a hospital. It, oxytocin peaks 15 minutes after the event that mm -hmm. triggers it with a blood draw. You can do saliva assays, but that's very distally related to brain process and, and, yeah. and blood flow. Uh, and then you can look at genes like we have, like the OXTR polymorphism on the third chromosome. Yeah. And I think that, you know, um, that has promising data associated with it. So, um, but it, you know, uh, we are enamored with neurophysiology, but very often the measures are indirect and early stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, two questions that I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna lump together and ask as one, and these were submitted by the discussion forum in the Science of Happiness class. Um, and I'm, I'm going to put them together because I think we can probably address them fairly quickly. And, and one is, what's the known relationship between religiosity and happiness? And the second is, how does exercise and physical fitness relate to happiness? Um, I'll start with the religiosity question um, briefly and summarily. Uh, when we explore correlations between happiness levels and the extent to which somebody uh, identifies as being part of a spiritual or religious community, there is a, a, a relatively strong positive correlation. Um, there's a couple interpretations of that. One is that it's a function of the community that comes right. with being part of a, of a religious organization or, or religious uh, neighborhood community. Uh, that is, you get more support from the other people who share this viewpoint with you. The other is, again, Dacker's territory, which is that there's something about uh, having a spiritual or religious perspective that involves experiencing states of awe. And that is reflecting on the possibility that you are in the presence of something much greater than yourself. And and um, Dagger, you've done, again, the, such pioneering work on awe, and we'll talk about awe in the last week of the course in this science, but any, any quick summary of what awe does and what it means and why it's important and what it might have to do with religiosity? Yeah, uh, so, you know, brief experiences of awe when you're around vast things that trans sort of challenge your understanding of the world, be it 
big redwood trees or big vistas or the Great Wall of China or mm -hmm. cathedrals in Spain and Yosemite and our student and, and inspiring people uh, mm -hmm. and art. Um, they reduce your stress. Mm -hmm. They make you feel humble. Mm -hmm. They make you feel like they're bigger things than your momentary worries. They improve your well-being. Um, and you know, there's this interesting view that I think is emerging. Uh, and Robert Wright, uh, one of my favorite writers, uh, who has a new book out on Buddhism, uh, writes about how um, religions, which do elevate happiness for spiritual religious practice, they reduce the likelihood of depression by 29%. Mm -hmm. if the correlations uh, with life expectancy. Um, they what they do. And I think Karen Armstrong would agree, which is that they take all of these pro-social tendencies and they ritualize them, right? So if you look at a great religious spiritual process, it's you're sharing food with people, you're expressing gratitude, it's awesome, it's beautiful, you're breathing, you're singing, you're touching other people. Uh, so it takes what we teach and systematizes it. Mm -hmm. um, and then that begs the question for the secular people out there, uh, like myself, which is what other communal processes do that, right? Do I get the same thing? I know my daughter, Serafina, gets that by being a, a camp counselor at a summer camp. Mm -hmm. It's just, it has the same structure yeah. minus cosmology mm -hmm. of religion. You know, I may get it at an Iggy Pop concert or whatever it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there are a lot of ways to uh, get that communal feeling. So physical exercise. Um, not something that, that I study directly, yeah. but it's certainly something anecdotally that matters in my sense of balance and well-being. Um, and I think that there is a, a, a ton of scientific evidence to support the relationship between a regular habit of getting your heart rate up and using your muscles and, and movement and perhaps even uh, yeah. more profound in the company of others yeah. uh, that, that, that is tied to, to well-being and, and subjective well-being or, or happiness, which as we all know are yeah. kind of overlapping constructs. So um, the, the reasons for that are, are wide and varied, but um, we, and, and we do kind of nod to it in the course, but we don't spend a lot of time on it. And maybe this is a little bit of a, of a Western uh, US bias that uh, it's our observation that you can find an exercise facility or an encouragement to take on physical exercise as a life habit pretty much anywhere you go. Any, any physician who you're seeing is gonna ask that question, is gonna advocate for that. On any street corner, you're gonna find a gym or a fitness center. So we've really adopted that as a, as a cultural ethos. This yeah. matters and it's really important to your well-being. So what we're trying to do in the Science of Happiness and at the Greater Good Science Center is, is highlight ideas that perhaps we haven't adopted in a wholehearted way um, in, in the interest of our own welfare. What do you think, Dee? Yeah, I think I think that's you know, uh, you know, to Donna's question earlier, if you're with somebody who is depressed, mm -hmm. child, parent, loved one, romantic partner, friend, uh, you know, as uh, Susan, no Susan Nolan Huxima, who is one of the pioneers in the study of depression, says, first principles like get out and move, because yeah. uh, when you move your body, it shifts physiology, it connects you to other people, mm -hmm. produces stress. So uh, it is it's canonical and and true. Uh, there are probably a lot of interesting explanations. The social dimension is often underemphasized, but uh, I think our mission, as Anne said, is to think about making these mental, emotional practices just as important as the, the physical. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, in our last minute, uh, it's always a shock to me how fast <laughs> this hour goes by. Um, of course, if I was viewing, it might not feel like it went so fast, but just <laughs> that when we're here talking, it just it just blows by. And, and I, I want to say thank you to all the people who took the time to write us questions. Yeah. We wouldn't be able to do this in, in such an interesting and compelling way. We really, I personally really value the opportunity to think again or to think anew about the ideas that come up in our in our in our Q and A's, both in real time, live 
and as people submit questions during the uh, on, on the discussion board. So appreciate that. Thank you for taking the time. Dacker, thank you for meeting with us and, and doing this conversation. It's always so such a, a, a pleasure to hear you respond spontaneously to questions about science. And uh, some often I learn things that- um, Me too. That, that weren't, weren't, weren't at the forefront. And, and again- Good to be Donna, with you. Donna, thank you. Thank you yeah. uh, very deeply for your contributions to the course and to this one hour live Q&A. And um, have a wonderful day.